Today's video is about the five things we learned from Sharp Objects, episode five. Hi guys, it's Karen with Completely Karen. Thanks so much for stopping by. If you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, go ahead and do that so that you can keep up on all of my latest reviews. Also, just as a reminder, I go into spoilers, so if you haven't watched this episode, or if you haven't read the book and don't want to know what happens in this episode, don't watch this video. Today's video, I'm going to be giving us the five things that we learn in Sharp Objects episode five. The first thing we learn is that Adora's bedroom floor represents the death of a thousand elephants, and she's proud of it. Adora takes Detective Willis on a tour of the house and one stop on the tour is her bedroom. Adora feels like she has to show off everything and brag about everything and of course one of those things is how her entire bedroom floor is made of pure ivory. Adora likes to brag that it was a gift to her great great grandmother as a wedding present and that it has survived perfectly all of these years. What I find interesting is how she thinks it's so very funny that it was before anybody knew what endangered was. Like because it was put in before that happened, it's okay to just keep it and show it off like it's no big deal. Adora, everyone sees that this weird taste for perfection and this pride level that you have completely overshadows any sense of goodness or righteousness that should be in your body and in your mind, but is completely not. Number two, we learn that Camille is completely terrified of entering said bedroom and stepping on that ivory floor. There is one point where she drops her vodka bottle disguised as a water bottle, on the floor of Adora's bedroom, just right inside the door. And it takes her far too long, and there is major trepidation before she stealthily retrieves it, making sure nobody is looking and no one sees that she actually had to take one step into the door to pick up the bottle. Now we see in a flashback that she, as a teenager, and her younger sister are waiting outside the door while their mother is getting ready for a photo shoot. They do not enter the room until one moment when Camille enters in and decides that she is going to play around with one of the cameras. She gets scolded harshly by her mother and her footprints are wiped up immediately after she leaves. It's also made quite clear in this scene that Camille was not included in the photo shoot for the magazine cover, but that her younger sister was. This is another glaring reminder to Camille that her mother truly does not love her. Number three, we learn that Camille's body is completely and entirely from neck to feet covered in cuts and words. Now this is something that has been hinted at. We probably didn't really understand the extent. We've seen Camille in the bathtub, but maybe just her arms have been showing. As a viewer, we feel very bad for Camille as she's standing in the dressing room, throwing the dress that her mother wants her to wear to Calhoun Day in her face, making the statement of, how the fuck do you want me to wear this tank top dress when my body looks like this and you fucking well know that it looks like this. We see that Adora and Emma are privy to the battle wounds and scars that Camille works very hard to cover and hide as it is one of her deepest and darkest, most shameful secrets. And yet they just stand there gawking. Now we as an audience can completely and 100% feel for Camille and understand how deep her wounds truly are. I wanna give a shout out to the FX department and or the makeup department, maybe it's a combination of both, I'm not quite sure, on making Amy Adams' body look completely grotesque that we as an audience can now truly understand the pain that Camille must be feeling on the inside. Number four. Now this one was more for my sake. As we learn that Missouri is actually considered a southern state, even though it's not quite a southern state, and they were a confederate state. Now when I looked this up, because that seemed confusing to me, I did learn that only parts of the state were considered confederate, and the other parts of the state were part of the union. As we know, Wind Gap is fictional, and so you can make it however the hell you want. Gillian Flynn has decided to make Wind Gap a confederate state, and they like to really wave that confederate flag every year during Calhoun Day when they celebrate the fact that their treasured Millie Calhoun was tied to a tree and raped by Union soldiers, but she still would not give up where her husband was and she would not betray him. We also learn during this play that Emma is a complete druggie. It's not just marijuana, but in this play, she is completely high as they flash back to her and some friends in the living room taking some pills 
And then we see that Emma is completely high on stage, which is later emphasized when all of the attention is taken off of Emma and onto a fight between John Keane and Bob Nash in the back. And everyone focuses on that rather than her. She freaks out and runs away and hides in the woods. Probably a mix between she always has to have the attention and she was high, so she wasn't quite sure what the fuck was happening. And finally, number five. We learn that everyone in Wind Gap is still completely convinced that the killer is a man. It's reiterated several times throughout the episode that the police really need to catch him, and I put that in finger quotes because basically that's what they all say, it's a him, and that there is no way it could be a woman because how could a woman pull out teeth? It also continues to be forced down our throats as viewers that the two main suspects are Bob Nash and John Keane. Now to me, this remains a completely stupid thing. I've said it in previous videos and I'll say it again. The police force really needs to take their heads out of their ass and figure out that everyone is a suspect, especially when half the women in this town have a tendency towards psychotic behavior, including emotional and psychological manipulation. I feel like those are good indicators that perhaps they should be looked at as well as the men who you seem to only think could be the only suspects. Hmm, I don't know, maybe do a better job. Just saying. Well, there you have it. There's five things that we learned from episode five of Sharp Objects. I still feel that this show is moving way too slow. I do think that we learned a few things in this episode, but again, I got so bored with the show that I had to read the book, so I actually know what's going to happen now. And I felt like the book really moved smoothly, was at a very good pace, and was not confusing at all. I don't agree that this show is doing the book the justice that it deserves. I feel that four episodes would have been the perfect amount to get everything in that needed to be in. And when you're giving entire episodes to a one-line mention in the book, I feel like it's a little overboard. That's just my opinion. Leave me a comment below and let me know what you learned from episode five and I'll see you next week for my review of episode six of Sharp Objects. Thanks for watching.